this is Voluminous. And as promised, here is a New Year's treat for you. A bonus clip from Jessica Stone's chat with the Bleak Expectations writer, Mark Evans. Do you have books lined up for your holiday reading? Uh, I have books lined up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I have a ridiculous... You've got a tower of books, have you? I have it. I just, oh, it's ridiculous. And, uh, you know, maybe you should do a separate chat with my wife about the number of books I own. No, and I buy think, I think she should chat with my husband about that because he would also be able to commiserate. <laughs> How many have you got on the go at the moment? How many have you got waiting? Oh, I haven't counted them. Uh, That's too depressing. There's, but, but I could probably, it's, it's no good for, an audio like this, but I could probably demonstrate the size of the stacks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> my, my, About yay high. <laughs> that's it. I, I once, I once read one summer holiday. I once read a pile of books a foot taller than my head. Oh. Uh, I'm three foot high. No, no, I'm, uh, <laughs> and I'm five foot ten. So I read nearly seven feet worth of books stacked up in one summer holiday. Um, and now currently by my bed, I, I think I've got it, it. Maybe it was sixty three. There's certainly. 40 or 50 or 60 books and uh, bought a special little new bookshelf to go by my bed. I filled that and now they're on the floor again. Right. And it's, I mean, you could describe it as a problem, but it's not the worst problem. It's not like they're empty vodka bottles. (laughs) Oh, I've got a stack of 63 vodka bottles I need to get through. It's not quite that. I just don't know which one to pick next. Well, I got halfway through that vodka bottle and I switched to another vodka bottle. It's not like that. (laughs) But how do you choose then when you've got so much to choose from? I mean, I find this actually yeah. quite paralyzing when I have so many books that I can see that I haven't read. Yeah. I then find it very difficult to choose one. So what do you do? Um, do you close your eyes and just rummage in the pile and pull one out and go? No, what I generally do is avoid looking them in the eye and <laughs> and buy another book <laughs> to, yes, and read that one instead. Yes. I don't know. It's when It's when you're sort of, when that pile becomes large, it becomes like a huge work project you've got to get through in a way. And the joy of them goes away a little bit. And you think, and then you procrastinate. And your procrastination displacement activity is buying another book that looks more exciting at the time. Yes, yes. And then, uh, and then, well, I can't read that until I've read some of these others that have been in the queue. Yes, so yes, the, it just, it's a vicious cycle. It is the guilty books <laughs> of vicious cycle, isn't it? it? It's quite terrible. I find bookshops quite... I find myself in bookshops quite often with a huge pile of books and I go, this is ridiculous. Go and put at least most of them back. <laughs> I tend to get on themes and that helps me. So, Oh, do you? I'm oddly on a theme of quite a lot of American non-fiction, American presidential non-fiction. biographies at the moment. Oh. Theodore Roosevelt, the Edmund Morris trilogy. I read the first one and thought, I'd like to read this. I and feel I went, like oh, his, amazing. his story might lend itself to... Uh spoofing if um he's an extraordinary character and it, it i you know people know much about him but he in many ways I mean, he's he's quite like the earlier american churchill they have quite similar attitudes towards life and uh and venturous go-getting slightly bonkers bigger larger than life stories and, yeah and i can see that both both went and fought in wars at the age of 40 when because when churchill left after the Dardanelles and the Gallipoli campaign went wrong, he went and commanded the battalion in the front line. It's like, what? Really? Okay, that's, you know, can you imagine a government minister doing that these days? Um, and Theodore Roosevelt did it when they went to war with uh, Spain to get the, the Americans fought to get the Spanish out of Cuba. And he went and formed his Rough Riders uh, Volunteer Cavalry <laughs> Regiment and fought, and he was 40-odd. And you go, okay, that's extraordinary. And I think in the end he did get the Congressional Medal of Honour for it. By yeah. fighting so valiantly, and you just think these people are slightly—I don't think you could—you couldn't have a life like that these days. There's, there's less to be explored. <laughs> people don't let you. They tend to go, but no, you've—you've you've got a degree in that, so just go and do that or whatever. Uh, he's an amazing character. It's—he's uh, one of those people you think, why is there not been a Netflix series about his life? Why for hasn't example? there? There's, I mean, a, there's he, a product for you. <laughs> he crops—he crops up in a couple of things. There's an adaptation of the um, the Alienist. Uh, the book The Alienist, which they adapted, and he crops up as one of the commissioners of the New York Police Department, which oh. was one of his jobs, and he crops up as a character in that, which not seen. But his whole life, I just I was reading the first, just the first volume, going, he's not even president yet. This is extraordinary. <laughs> um, yeah, he's and he struck me as actually, his life is a little bit like <laughs> Sir Philip Bin's description of his life. But a bit weirder, if that's possible. Because <laughs> when he when he stopped being president, 
he went and did some massive exploration. I haven't got onto this volume yet, so I don't know exactly. But he went on a massive expedition up some unexplored river in Africa um, at the age of nearly 50. And he just wanted to do something vigorous yeah. and dangerous so he could feel alive again. You think, wow, that's extraordinary. It's really, I've got to say, it's really hard to identify with that personally because... Yes. <laughs> I feel perfectly alive. Thanks very much. <laughs> yes. And the modern president, you know, what did Barack Obama do? He went golfing for six months or something. Oh, no, he did do that thing very with sensible. Bear Grylls. Uh, oh, he no, did, yeah, he did yeah. Bear Grylls Adventure Island, didn't he? Yeah, that's that's he a did. bit weird. It, is, it, was, it was a bit weird. Um, and presumably there were massive amounts of Secret Service still around just off camera because... Yeah, must have been. Presidents keep their Secret Service retinue for a long time. Oh, yeah, I imagine them, like, hiding behind boulders, you know, like... Yeah. Ready to leap out. <laughs> I'm persuaded not to shoot Bear grills. <laughs> you don't make the president do that, sir. <laughs> Take him out. <laughs> when you're reading, are you mostly reading for pleasure or for inspiration or for both? Oh, that's a good question. I never thought about that. I think I only read for pleasure. And if inspiration comes, that's, that's, the, that's a bonus, I think. I, I, you know, I just, reading is my number one thing, I think. And I, mean, I love TV. I love radio. That's, that's, those are the media I work in. And uh, I sort of, I, mean, I think, you know, I, I often default to a book. I haven't got a good book on the go. I'm feeling quite, I feel quite weird. Um, right. A little bit uneasy about the entire world. It, it's like like the world is going to crash in because I haven't got a book I'm enjoying at the moment. That's tricky. And I think a lot of inspiration does come. Like like reading Theodore Roosevelt and just going, why has no one made that? And I don't know that will inspire me in any way to do anything with it because uh, I, I live in North London and I'm not American and no one will let me do that, I'm sure. But... Um, <laughs> I think you, you sort of find the inspiration thing. and I think because I enjoy reading so much and I get so lost in it sometimes I don't get inspired and um, you get you know I, you know, people go oh I read this book and it gave me this idea and that and I'm like oh I just oh right I just read that book <laughs> I just oh yeah that is a good idea why didn't I think that I was too into it I was too <laughs> um, but I do yeah I, I think a lot of I think you get ideas from anywhere really they pop in anywhere but I think a lot of I quite like reading obscure subjects in non-fiction so i read a, mm. a, a very interesting book on um i'm quite <laughs> one of my minor obsessions is container shipping and uh sorry container yeah shipping? container shipping i find it absolutely fascinating and i think it's uh you know it's, it's an amazing development that changed the world enormously and um that's uh, a sentence I never thought I would it, hear. It, it, it genuinely did change shipping. the world it, it, in, in extraordinary ways. And uh, I don't think my wife has ever forgiven me for, we were on a ferry out to, on our honeymoon, we were on a ferry out to uh, Alcatraz in San Francisco. Right. And um, we take a picture of her on the side of the ferry. I went, oh, no, to your left, to your left. Can you move down a bit? To your left, to your left. She's <laughs> going, are you trying to get the San Francisco frame nice? I went, no, one of the biggest container ships in the world is passing behind you. I want that in it. <laughs> so when I made a book of the photographs for her birthday the other year i made that the center the <laughs> container i find that very interesting but the, that's the sort of obscure subject i go well oh yeah that's interesting i might read that 350 page slightly academic <laughs> book on container shipping wow that was interesting right i'll read a stephen king now because that's a bit easier <laughs> um and are you reading them as physical books are you reading them as uh ebooks or as audiobooks or well can, I know, you see the kindle and the ebook i think is a really interesting development and i have to say and this is terrible of me saying this in here on this because uh, i i've never listened to an audiobook because um i uh, get out yeah i know it's weird <laughs> isn't it it's very odd um it i don't know why um I, well, I do know slightly why. I stopped listening to podcasts and things like that for a while because the headphone jack on my phone broke. And I oh. didn't get it replaced for three years. And I used to listen to podcasts while I was walking and I stopped. I went, it's quite nice just actually listening to the yeah, trees and things. They make and wireless headphones it, now. It, Yeah, <laughs> yes, they do. That it wouldn't have worked on my iPhone 4. Um, so I sort of got out of the habit of it just as podcasts were really taking off. I used to listen to a lot of screenwriting podcasts and, and things like that. And, and audiobooks just coming in. So I never... Was that bit, I think... Listening to an audiobook would feel like I'm cheating myself of reading a book. <laughs> okay. Slightly, but I understand them brilliantly. I know loads of people who love audiobooks, and um, yeah, I've got a friend who went on holiday to America, and he said, I bought an audiobook of, uh, I thought, I want something entertaining, and he bought an audiobook of the first Lee Child Jack Reacher book, Killing Floor, and he went, brilliant. And now he started reading, the, and when he goes on big trips, he gets an audiobook of a Lee Child, and he reads one at, uh, and, you know, any 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 writer who says they think Lee Child is rubbish is lying, because they're, they're wrong. Lee Child's brilliant. I'm just saying that. You can read all the Dickens and things you want, but Lee Child is a brilliant, There's a new one coming writer. out soon, isn't it's there? It's November the 5th. <laughs> November the 5th. Past tense. 
It's called past tense. There you go, Lee. You can have that. I think you need me plugging you. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's not doing well yeah. enough on his own. His sales have dropped to a mere <laughs> billion. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, audiobooks. Uh, oh yeah, the ebook Kindle thing. Um, I, I got a Kindle some years ago. My wife bought me a Kindle for Christmas to uh, save uh, about five hundred feet of shelf space <laughs> for all the books I buy, and uh, incidentally, also probably our marriage because if I you know got too many books, I think she might just throw me out and go go and live in a library because <laughs> uh, it looks like you do already, and I really enjoyed reading on it for a long while i still do read on it but i found and i know this is the thing that ebooks rocketed and then have dropped off again yeah and it's almost like the human brain has only a limited capacity for reading on the electronic device and everyone wants to get back to the real books do you well, find do you find have you done that with a I kindle i find or? that uh well first of all i don't i don't actually use um an e-reader anymore if i'm reading an ebook i just read on my phone cuz it's smaller mm. And the the reason why I read any ebooks at all is so that I can read at night when my husband is trying to sleep yeah. and, a, and a reading light yeah. would bother him and the sound of pages and whatever. So yeah. if I have my phone on the night mode yeah. and under the duvet, <laughs> that great. seems to be enough to uh, to prevent mm. any squabbles about, well, about uh, that. I don't want to plug but, necessarily, but I believe the Kindle Paperwhite is very good at that. It's, it's muted, but it is backlit. So that's, I have heard that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the thing is that... E- the the whole ebooks thing they haven't replaced physical books for no. me it's just in addition to and i think i think for a while the industry you know thought that that it was going to replace physical yeah. books but i think both because of readers finding that there's room in their lives for both and because i think the publishers also reacted by upping their game with more beautifully produced physical books, yes, that are much more attractive to you know uh, to see and to touch. Like some of them have these really lovely soft covers that yeah. are very tactile, and um, and so I think there's a combination of things going. But I don't think either one is is going to be eliminating the other anytime soon. No, I think I I, I know um, someone. Uh... A fellow parent at my kid's school is a book designer and he was ah. talking about that saying yeah his he gets to do more fun stuff because that's how they fight back against the ebook yes. um, and the publishers are probably willing to pay <laughs> yeah for that for that extra design yeah and he finds God. that yeah. he finds that so i i i went my i read everything on kindle for a while and i loved it doing that and then gradually i found that i couldn't read non-fiction on it it oh was, really? It became a weird thing. It was like, oh, it turns out my Kindle and my brain join up for fiction, but not non-fiction, and partly that's because, I mean, on a, it, it was a very basic or you know normal Kindle. It's not a Kindle Fire or anything like that. But if if you want to look at a map of a battle in a military history book, for example, it, it's it's terrible on a basic Kindle because it's a basic model. I'm sure, it's much better on a Kindle Fire. But I mm. I found the physicality of being able to flick back to the map I wanted to look at was so yes. much easier. and yeah. But also something deep down psychologically didn't let me read non-fiction anymore on mm. my... And then now I tend to use my Kindle for... I use it to go on holiday because I can take as many books as my Kindle's got in it rather than going, oh, shall I have this? Shall I have that? Shall I have that? Shall I take 3,000 pages worth of reading with me on holiday because I will be taking those massive silly books? <laughs> it's easy to take your Kindle. But I find I read less and less on it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, it's a very weird thing. I don't know. I don't know that's affected a lot of people or it's just me. But I suspect a lot of people just go, the brain sort of goes, well, that was great. I enjoyed that. But uh, I like, I want the paper. I want the paper under my yeah. fingers. Yeah. Well, I do find um, that it helps me remember what I've read better right. if, if it's something I'm physically seeing and, and holding rather than digital. Yeah, that's interesting. There's probably a whole bunch of PhDs being written about that at the moment I'm, in I'm neurology sure. and psychology. <laughs> but I, it also makes me think of, um, you know, last year's Man Booker winner, um, George Saunders. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Lincoln, Lincoln and the Bardo. The, yeah. yeah. I was going to say Lincoln and the Lido. That's a very different book. <laughs> <laughs> that's the <Yeah>. sequel. <laughs> it was a hot summer in Washington. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln put on his trunks. <laughs> You can have that, George. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I tried reading Lincoln and the Bardo as an ebook, and it just doesn't work because the layout is super important ah, for yeah. that, and it, it just doesn't work. It I didn't work for me. It's very sparse on the page, and 
Yeah, it was just an ascetic looking book. It was really hard to tell when you're shifting voice um, because the layout wasn't preserved in the digital format as it it was um, in the physical book, at least the the e-book that I had borrowed from my library. And, you know, it's my own fault because that was a beautiful, beautifully uh, produced book like the end pages yeah. are so pretty it's like it looks like oh, really? marble like the like the oh, monument you know oh lovely and uh so i'm kicking myself that i didn't get that when it was first out and when i first wanted it because then after it's won the man booker then all all of the jackets now say man booker winner or whatever and there's there's this vanity in me that doesn't want <laughs> You want to you want to be reading it on the tube instead of going. I was interested in this before it won the Man Booker. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, we all have our little. Um, that that, our that little reminds fools. me of the time I thought someone really should have been reading something on a Kindle. I was on the tube <laughs> and I saw a woman. Um, you know, she might be probably about my age in her forties or something, and uh, and she was sort of biting her lip a little bit in a slightly. That's a bit odd. And, I looked, and she was reading. I looked at her and she was reading Fifty Shades of oh, Grey. No. And I kind of wanted to lean over and go, get a Kindle, because your <laughs> face and that together makes me think, you! <laughs> you're having thoughts. I mean, they might be very pleasurable, but you're in a different place. You are not on the Piccadilly line anymore, madam. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, yes, so... Um... <laughs> Sorry. I... Sorry. Brought this place down to a my own sort of <laughs> level. And that really is it for Series 1, but make sure you subscribe to keep up to date with news for Series 2. And let us know what you think of the podcast by leaving a review on iTunes, and maybe tell us what you'd like to hear us cover in the future. Listening Books is a UK charity that provides audiobooks for those who struggle to read print, due to illness, disability or learning difficulties. Find out more at listening-books.org.uk Happy New Year!